from the section of Augsburg Confession this evening. The first text is from the second letter to the Corinthians. It's on page 967 in your pew Bibles. Second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading is Luke chapter 15. That's on page 874 in your pew Bibles. And notice here that we have three parables, and uh, they're all fairly well known. The first two are quite short. Uh, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin. The third, titled due to the parable of the prodigal son, uh, could just as easily be titled a number of other things. The parable of the lost son. It continues that theme from the first two, but it's an expansion of the same themes that are present in the first two. It could also be entitled the parable of the prodigal father. Uh, it, needs, it needs to be loose. And as the son is loose with spending the money, the father is loose with his love for the son. And that's what the uh, older son eventually scorns him for. Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country, and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home... He calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me. For I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and sent him into his fields, to, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants, and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, then I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. We will join in confessing our faith here in the words of the Oxford Confession, Article 12, on repentance. Point to me in your bulletin. Please arise. Our churches teach that there is forgiveness of sins for those who have fallen after baptism when they are converted. The church ought to impart absolution to those who return to repentance. Now, strictly speaking, repentance consists of two parts. One part is contrition, that is, terror striking the conscience through the knowledge of sin. The other part is faith, which is born of the gospel, or the absolution that believes that for Christ's sake, sins are forgiven. It comforts the conscience and delivers it from terror. Then good works are bound to follow, which are the fruit of repentance. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists, who deny that those who have once been justified can lose the Holy Spirit. They also condemn those who argue that some may reach such a state of perfection in this life that they cannot sin. The Novatians also are condemned, who would not absolve those who had fallen after baptism, though they returned to repentance. Our churches also reject those who do not teach that forgiveness of sins comes through faith, but command us to merit grace through satisfactions of our own. They also reject those who teach that it is necessary to perform works of satisfaction commanded by church law in order to remit eternal punishment or the punishment of purgatory. Please see it. What does uh, real repentance look like? A child who disobeys is reprimanded and says sorry, even while getting ready to do the same thing again. I, the reason that Anna isn't here tonight is because she refused to eat her vegetables. And while she was refusing to eat them, after I said, I'm disappointed in you, she said, I'm sorry. And I said, if you were sorry, eat your vegetables. You can't be sorry for something while you're in the process of continuing to do it. And yet, does that mean that just because somebody will shortly do something again, they aren't really sorry about it? Or what about somebody who says they're sorry just to avoid punishment? You can't always tell if that's the case, but that isn't true repentance either. Or what about if it's simply a mental exercise? Like, just, just take it a catalog of all the ways that you fail to keep God's law and kind of listing them off. Is that repentance? Or does repentance have to show itself? If someone says they are sorry, should you wait for them to prove it until you forgive them? True repentance, according to Scripture, only has two parts, as we just confessed in the Oxford Confession. The first is terror over sin. That's produced by the law. It's the godly grief that Paul talked about in our reading from 2 Corinthians. It's what the Ninevites displayed when Jonah came preaching, repent, or in 40 days you're all going to be destroyed. And they were terrified, and they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repented, and God relented. That terror that is produced by the law is a divine work. Man doesn't produce it on his own. We don't decide to be sorry for our sins. We don't decide to be in terror of God's judgment. God's law whips and scourges us to fear the consequences of sin and to weep over our failure to love God and to love our neighbor as we should. That's God's work. But it's still only the first part. It is not faith. Was not Judas greatly grieved when he saw what he had done and what was going to happen to Jesus? Yet he killed himself in despair. He lacked the second part of repentance, which is faith. As terror over sin is produced by the law, so faith in Christ is produced by the gospel. It is a word of sweet promise from the lips of the Savior, which cancels the punishments of the law and therefore removes the terror which the law produces and remits the guilt of sin and therefore calms the conscience upset by what I have done. He says, Jesus says, peace to you. See, I have borne the punishment for you. 
all is well. Your sins are forgiven and my righteousness is yours. And this is the great joy of our shepherd and of all of heaven. They long for sinners like you and me to repent, to be struck down by the law and to be raised up by the gospel. And that should be our joy too. And it's important to remember the way that we deal with one another and, and with our children. See, I think that we have a tendency to demand outward proof. If you're really sorry, you'll do this. Sounds a little different when they're literally in the process of continuing to disobey you. But Peter had once said to Jesus, Jesus said, if your brother sins, forgive him. Peter says, how many times shall I do that? Seven times in a day? And Jesus says, no, 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 77 times, meaning as many times as possible. Can you imagine if somebody did the exact same thing to you, simple thing to you, 77 times in one day? I'm pretty sure he would begin to assume that they weren't really sorry when they said sorry afterwards. It's probably happened with your children after like seven times. And yet, first of all, as, as, as we're talking about personal forgiveness, we're to forgive them immediately, even while they're doing it, no matter what. But to give God's forgiveness too, when somebody repents, we give them that assurance of God's forgiveness. We can't demand out the proof. If we withhold forgiveness until someone proves that their repentance is true, then we are saying that they have to do something to make up for their sin in order to earn forgiveness. And then there are no longer two parts to repentance, but three. There's the terror of the law, which is God's work. And there's the comfort of the gospel and faith, which is God's work. But now we're adding a third. And that's our proof, which we're making our proof. That's what the papists, the Roman Catholics, were teaching and still teach. That there are not two parts, but three. That you have to do something in order to prove that your repentance is sincere. And if you don't, no absolution. Instead, as we saw, there are only two parts. And then there are fruits which flow from it. See, fruits of repentance aren't properly speaking a part of repentance. They are what comes out of repentance. And true repentance does show itself in works. For instance, if you stole something, and you came to me, and you confessed, you know, that you had stolen this from this store, and you repented of your sin, I would tell you, your sin is forgiven. And I would expect that you would go and return what you stole. I wouldn't say that, that, that your forgiveness was based upon that, but if you were really sorry... If you were really filled with sorrow for sin and faith in Christ and the gospel, it would show itself by returning what you stole. There is nothing that you need to do to make things right with God. But when you sin against your neighbor, there is something you need to do to make things right with your neighbor. And God commands you to do it. To return what was stolen, to make up for what was lost. And that's a fruit of repentance. You can see this in, in our readings today with, with the lost sheep and the lost coin and the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus teaches about repentance and about how it is his work, right? The shepherd goes and seeks the lost sheep. The woman goes and seeks a lost coin. The father, when his son, prodigal son was far away, it says that when the son was still a long way off, the father ran to him, which could only be one thing that the father was watching for him and came to him. And you know, the son had prepared his little speech. This was his penance, right? I'm not worthy to be your son. But you just make me a servant. He's kind of bargaining, right? And the father doesn't even listen. He, he, he cuts him off. He in interrupts him halfway through his speech. And he pours out all of his love and grace and mercy on him. And so it is with our father, too. He works repentance in us. He works faith in us. He runs to us, hugs us crowns us with his salvation, with his love, with the forgiveness of our sins, with glory. And both of these things, and the law and the gospel, impel us every day towards repentance. You know, I used to work at Sweetwater's restaurant in Eau Claire, and uh, I was a host there for a while, and every Friday night there was this same, you know, nice couple that would sit in the bar, and they'd be only about 15 feet away from me, and we would talk all the time. And they, she was a member, I can't remember if a guy was or not, she was a member at an ELCA church in town. And this was right around the time that everything was going on with you know, uh, them ordaining gay pastors. And she asked me, she knew I was studying to be a pastor, she said, what do you think about that? I said, what do you think about that? She says, well, my pastor says they're not worse sinners than us, and Jesus died for them too. And I said, those things are both true. 
but your pastor is using them to suggest that they therefore don't need to repent. Those are statements of law and gospel, universal law. All are equally sinful. And justification, universal justification, and that Christ has paid for the sins of all. And that pastor used them to say that nobody really needs to repent of their sin. Yeah, get rid of repentance entirely. But the Bible uses the one to demand repentance, sorrow for sin, the first half, terror, and the other, that sweet voice of the gospel, to invite faith and to work that faith in us. This is Christ's work, repentance. And it's two parts. And his work is also the fruits which flow from it. He produces those in us. Amen. We'll continue with the...